Hi, Amanda. Welcome to Automation Unpacked Tales from the Warehouse. Thank you for being here. Hey, Chloe. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, we've been wanting you to We've been wanting to get you on the podcast. Amanda Seiken is the Director of Engineering at SBT Robotics, and we are excited to have you and start to dive into the platform a little bit more, sort of take a more behind the scenes look at what goes into building a soft bot, building the platform, and how that impacts our customers, and particularly the ops teams, the IT teams, what effect that has on them um, from a day-to-day perspective. Um, So before we get into that, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your background and how you got into software development and what led you to SBT. Absolutely. So I fell into software development almost as an accident during college. I was actually studying mathematics and had to take an intro to programming course. And I actually fell in love with um, software engineering. And I'm very grateful because I'm not sure what I would have done with a math degree. I'm sure there's jobs out there, but I'm very happy in the position I'm in. And it's led me to some really cool opportunities, such as SVT Robotics. So I, ac- I actually joined SVT almost three years ago. It was August 2020. And I came in as a software engineer, working with some of our earliest customers on the SoftBot platform. And I've been fortunate to see the growth of the platform, the growth of the company in my time at SVT, um, both as a software engineer to an engineering manager and now to director of engineering. Amazing. And to be to and to clarify, this is your first foray or SVT is your first foray like myself into the supply chain industry, correct? That's right. I come from more of an e-commerce background in my previous experience. So I was completely new to the material handling space. Um, But I've actually really fallen in love with it as well. It's really interesting to see how things get from a warehouse into the homes of a consumer. I think we're all familiar with the experience of ordering something online. Maybe you're tracking it on your phone, shows up on your doorstep. Um, But there's so many pieces that have to fall into place for that item to get from somewhere to your home. And understanding the journey and how many people touch that item and everything that's needed to make that successful um, has been really fascinating. Absolutely. Yeah, when you think about it, uh, I think it's just obviously accelerated with during COVID, right? Um, We're all a lot more familiar with you know, the supply chain delays, et cetera. Um, and one of the things as myself, as new to the industry, um, comes up a lot as we start to talk about automation and when you're talking to friends and family and starting to describe what we do, I think sometimes there's a reaction of like robots are over. Like there's a lot of fear, I think, and maybe just unknown around it. And would love to hear your experience explaining sort of what we do at SVT, where we sit in this space, and sort of how you think about the, I think, massive shift towards automation and robotics. Definitely. So like you described, I get a range of reactions when I tell people what I do. Generally, the first reaction is a bit of a blank stare. Um, It's sort of You have to explain a bit of background to understand the context of SVT, especially in material handling. Um, So like you said, after the blank stare, it's, oh, robots are taking over. Are you worried the robots are going to wake up and get you in your sleep one day? Or, oh, those robots are taking jobs to, oh, my gosh, you guys are like Amazon. Do you work with Amazon? Um, It's interesting because... It just shows how little understanding there is of automation in our day to day, which is fascinating because most people do come into contact with automation in their daily lives, whether they realize it or not. So as far as robots taking over the world, I want to be clear, that's not a concern of mine at all. I've seen these robots in the warehouse. And if you're picturing something like, 
AI robot where it's a humanoid figure, you know, nothing could be farther from the truth. Um, Automation can come in many forms, you know, big or small. So when I explain it to someone who's less familiar with the space, I start with a small example of think of a little bot that just roams around, follows you around the warehouse that you might put something on it and it will take you to the next location. Um, kind of makes me think of like a dog actually following its owner in some ways um, to something like a small LED screen that's going to light up when you're um, choosing an item from the inventory uh, to something like an automatic sorter. So lots of conveyor belts, diverting packages left and right, for example. That usually starts to paint the picture of what I mean when I say we help automate warehouses. It's usually a lot less sophisticated than what your everyday person is picturing. All right. So for a lot of customers that are looking to deploy automation, As you know, it's a massive decision and there's a lot of anxiety um, around it. And I'm wondering, you've talked to various people on that side of the table. Could you speak to what they're going through and why this is such a massive decision? Absolutely. Um, So, yes, I've been on the other end of the line with some stressed out CIOs before. Um, And it's understandable because it is a big investment. And in some ways, it's a big risk. Going into automation can be expensive, um, costs a lot of time, but it can really pay off in terms of efficiency and growth of the company. So I think a lot of that anxiety comes around the integration piece. When you buy a piece of automation, does not automatically speak to all your existing software systems or other pieces of automation you're bringing in that need to work together. And as companies, particularly um, these third-party logistics companies, start shopping around for integrators, they run into a couple challenges. So often it's timelines. Time to integrate is coded at I think around like six months to 18 months for even just one integration. Um, and there's also that feeling of then being trapped in the integration and the technology you've chosen. So that's where SVT starts to play a part in the process. Our integration platform is technology agnostic and it's meant to be the translator, the glue between all these different systems. And Besides the flexibility piece that we offer, it's really the time savings um, that I think companies really see the value of SVT because our platform eases the integration through our low-code, no-code um, softbot designer that allows for quick, seamless integration. And most importantly, if you're looking to integrate one site, but you know you will expand to multiple sites in the future, After the initial deployment, it's almost a copy and paste to each subsequent site. Um, So when companies hear that, it really speaks to them because that tells them, okay, I can expand with SVT as a partner and they will make that process so much easier. And just to back up a little bit, can you, in your own words, I know you work on this on the SoftBot platform and you've built SoftBots. Um, could you just speak high level uh, how the platform works, what a softbot is, um, and how it enables that level of ease and scalability? You're integrating robots, but it's easy to change, just like software is easy to change. So the process of building a softbot, we tend to think about softbots in kind of two categories, one a connector and one an orchestrator. You can think of a connector as sort of the API plugin for a piece of edge tech. And an orchestrator is more responsible for business logic and coordinating, orchestrating those pieces of edge tech. Now, to be clear, it's not a WES and it's not a WMS. In fact, it would, the platform would sit between those different softwares. Um, and help translate or augment some thin layers of business logic to edge tech. 
So depending on the soft bot and depending on the edge tech, we usually start with the API from uh, the OEM of the piece of equipment. And going off the API, we start to discreetly identify the actions of the edge tech and abstract the behavior of the edge tech into the connector such that it could then be plugged in with multiple connectors, multiple orchestrators. The goal is to build reusable connectors so that it's kind of a plug and play experience, which means no matter the WMS sitting at the other end and no matter the edge tech sitting at the other end, you could swap those out. They're almost interchangeable. Now for an orchestrator, when we're orchestrating business logic and communicating to the connectors for those edge techs. Um, to me, that's where things get a little more interesting because the human element starts to play a part. So when we're connecting to edge tech, like I said, we're going off an API, a spec sheet. There's going to be a period of testing with the actual equipment. Ideally, we have a simulator in our experience center to really understand the behavior and the requests and responses coming from the edge tech. But when you get into orchestration logic, that's when you have to understand also what the human on the other side is physically doing in the warehouse. So for example, one of my favorite projects I worked on was a put wall manager, an automated put wall manager um, that was actually used at a couple different customer projects or customer sites, excuse me. And understanding, okay, this is when an item comes into the put wall. This is how we should respond. But also really grasping what the human is doing. Okay, now they're taking it out of the put wall. Now there's an exception. Um, perhaps an order line is shorted. What is the person doing in that moment? And I really like that phase of development because that's all about user experience. And so with my background um, doing web development, user experience is very important. And it's actually equally important when we're building softbots as well. Um, and then of course, the flexibility of the platform makes it easy to do tweaks as we're testing with the customer, which is faster feedback loop than again your traditional software development you code you deploy the application okay it doesn't work okay you code again you deploy it versus being able to make a small adjustment right there on site yeah so, and going off of that could you actually explain for folks listening in on what those that that capability looks like in terms of ability to troubleshoot monitor um and and resolve issues Yes, definitely. So as a software developer, you always have to plan for the worst. Of course, we're going to write great code, but it's not going to work 100% of the time. And then knowing where something went wrong becomes really important. And again, in traditional software development, um, you might accomplish that by having great logging statements in your code, being able to search those statements, et cetera. With the platform, out of the box, we log every single transaction of a softbot. And that is just inherent in the platform's design. We actually display that flow of information in a visual format. So you don't need an experienced engineer looking through endless text files to find the one bit of information um, that's going to explain what happened. You can actually have someone just like yourself looking at a screen, tracing the flow of logic um, and highlighting exactly where an error occurred to pinpoint the problem. Okay, that's helpful. And I'm curious if you can speak to some of the experiences that you've had, because obviously, you know, in your role at SVT, you've built soft bots, um, you've been able to go on site with some customers and actually see how this is impacting them firsthand. And I'd love for you to describe some of those moments where it kind of clicked for the end user um, in terms of what the platform, you know, people, I think every software out there probably promises the moon and stars above, 
right? So I think it's important to actually key into like, how does that impact them? It's actually live. It's actually deployed. What does that mean to them? And can you describe what you've seen firsthand? Definitely. So going back to some of the anxiety and stressful part of integration, um, I was on site with a customer recently, just a couple weeks ago, and there were some interactions with the equipment. They actually had an automated put wall um, where some of the behavior wasn't quite what they expected. And when you're on site with the customer, and when I say the customer, in this case, I'm really talking about the people in the warehouse handling the product who are my favorite people to work with because they're on the front line and um, they will let you know what they think of the product very honestly. And so since the equipment wasn't behaving properly, there's a lot of frustration and you're there feeling their frustration and very motivated to find an answer to why this one thing isn't working um, and understand how to fix it. So in this particular case, we had an issue where lights weren't triggering and these were lights to alert us to pull the order off the wall and pack it. Any delay in that triggered pull the order off the wall is going to slow down all their operations. And this frustration, we can all relate to feeling frustrated with a piece of technology that's not behaving as expected. Um, but in that is mixed with the anxiety I mentioned earlier of was this automation the right choice? Is this going to actually work? So a lot of motivation to find the problem. Now, luckily, because we have such detailed logs and such detailed troubleshooting, within a couple of minutes, I was able to identify the exact execution that was responsible for the incorrect behavior and then use those logs to trace back um, back a couple minutes, back a couple, like forward a couple minutes to see the chain reaction, if you will, and really triangulate where the problem was coming from and identify the fix. And being able to do that and make the fit, not just make the fix, but actually explain to the people on the floor who are dealing with the problem, hey, this is exactly what's happening and even show them. Um, was just, again, this feeling of weight off your shoulders because it's like, oh, okay, that's where the problem is. We all see it. And you start to have some camaraderie with the people you're actually building this for and using the tool. Absolutely. Absolutely. And could you describe how our technology supports um, different peak seasons for customers? Because obviously, like, okay, great, they're deployed, they're set up within a very specific scenario with certain circumstances um, and specific volumes, but how, how, are, how is it impacted by those other variables? Right. Um, so again, on the same onsite visit, I actually got that question from an operations manager um, because as you said, warehouses tend to operate one way through most of the year, but holiday season, things get heavy and operations may need to change during that time. And I've particularly seen that's when automation plays an even bigger part because you're doing more volume. Um, so luckily with the platform, as I mentioned, the flexibility to change bits of logic, even have dynamic configuration where you can just flag different behavior um, that someone, again, someone at your level would be able to go in and just make that tweak. You don't need an engineer to build a whole new integration is really critical to um, creating the opportunity that you just mentioned. So when it comes to different volumes, different seasons, um, we have the ability to route messages to a particular softbot that may be responsible for high volume operations. Again, based on something as simple as a feature flag. Yeah, that's huge. And, you know, from your time on site, could you describe a moment when the customer kind of sort of got it, not got it, but like 
kind of could see it in action. Like, okay, this is why we're doing this. This is why we've gone through everything. Um, and could really start to see the power of automation and more flexible integration. Um, what was that moment like? Yes. So those are always the best moments for sure. Um, <clears throat> so typically it, that aha moment is when we finish a batch of orders early in the day, maybe even hours earlier than the crew is used to fulfilling that amount of orders. And so I think there was a recent moment where, you know, I'd been on site all day. We get to the afternoon. There's like a lull in activity. Um, we're all kind of like, what's going on? Are we fulfilling more orders? Where's the inventory? And then the operations manager came up and said, um, we don't have any more inventory. We've fulfilled all the orders. We're actually done for the day. And we're all kind of like, wow, okay, we just got through you know, a certain percentage of expected volume way faster than we've ever seen. I mean, you kind of see all the the people on the floor looking around at each other like, okay, I guess, you know, we get, we're, we're done. Like we get to take off early. Um, that's, that's an exciting moment. And I also appreciate being on site in those moments because you hear you hear the anecdotes that aren't going to come through normally unless you're there um where people start saying oh my gosh i remember that one time we had to stay like three hours late because we were moving so slowly and i missed like a friend's birthday or something um and they're just they just start talking about all these horror stories of when they just had to work so much harder and that's when it starts to click to see, oh, this machine actually made my life easier. It helped us get through volume much faster. And it is important to be aware of the impact to like the overall company's revenue, their ROI on um, that piece of automation. Yes, that's important, but there's also that actual benefit to the people who have to be in the warehouse and seeing their quality of life improve with the automation. And that's what I tend to focus on way more. Yeah, that's huge. I mean, we're all people at the end of the day. Um, and that's such a, it's a good story. Thank you for sharing that. I think it, it's such a contrast. I was on, uh, we had Steve Thorne on the podcast and he was talking about some stories from back in the day where they're deploying automation using just traditional integration and custom code. Um, and people had to leave early because they couldn't work except because the automation and the integration had failed and they couldn't figure out how to troubleshoot. So sounds like people are done early and going home for a good reason in this scenario. Um, what do you think is most misunderstood as you've had conversations with customers um, and helping them deploy tech? What do you find is the most misunderstood um, aspect about automation, our platform, and what it takes to to deploy? Hmm. Well, I could go in a lot of directions with that because, I mean, the, the SoftBot platform, nothing like it really exists today. So there is a lot of education to understand, okay, what it is what it is not um but i'd actually focus again on the people element i have been in warehouses um you know talking to it managers and something that's surprised me again and again in terms of my own understanding is how critical the process around automation is for it to be successful so this is just my perspective. There can tend to be an underestimation on getting the human processes right around automation. Um, because you can have the best auto you can have the best technology in the world. You can have our amazing platform to integrate all these technologies, but if your people processes don't line up around that, it's never going to be successful. And it's not just um, processes, it's also 
the actual attitude of your people. So if you're not putting the the operations folks first and involving them in the automation, it's not going to be a good result because they have to be bought in to really make it all work. Yeah, I think that's such a good point. Um, and curious in your experience, what, uh, yeah, who are the key players that you have seen be really present and engaged um, to ensure that successful deployment? Obviously, the ops teams, um, IT, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, anything else that you definitely, uh, or you've definitely seen be really uh, critical in terms of the success of the deployment from a, you know, people's perspective? That's a good question. As you mentioned, it's the coordination of a lot of different groups within a company. So, of course, SVT were there as a party. But then, as you said, there's the CIO, there's the IT team, there's the operations team. Um, and we all have to be on the same page when it comes to the deployment. <clears throat> and that's where a lot of friction can come up, just quite honestly. Um, you know, our deployments are pretty seamless, but we still have to have good communication with the IT team to make sure the right firewall rules are in place. As a small example, can't tell you how many times a firewall rule has just been like the needle in my side um, that when you finally figure out, it's like, oh, like the clouds part, the sun is shining. Um, <clears throat> so communication with that team is so important to just get things off the ground. Um, the buy-in, the support of the CIO is really important because they're worried about so, because everyone has different concerns in this process, the ops team wants to know, is this going to make my life easier or harder? Because I already work really hard. I already work in a warehouse. Um, I need every bit of help I can get. The IT team is wondering, okay, is this just going to be another system I have to be responsible for that's going to be a pain in my backside? And then the CIO is wondering, okay, is this going to cause a data breach that's going to bring down my whole company? And you know, we spoke about the anxiety present in all of this, and that's where it's all coming from. So for us at SVT, we have to understand the perspective of each of those groups to be able to provide a product that actually works for everyone and is not going to cause any friction between all those different concerns. Yeah, that's that's. That's a good answer. I feel like um, there are so many moving parts, and I think that's such a nice reminder that it will take the coordination of so many parties. And um, I think on our end, or you know, all other like whether it's an OEM provider or an SI or or us, um, the the need to really help educate and support and reduce the risk for all parties is is just so important. Um, and I think that kind of going back to soft bots, um, the whole idea is that because they're reusable, that risk is inherently decreased, right? Um, yeah. yeah. So, right. That's like we said earlier, that's, that's where like the copy and paste for your site expansion is, you know, a big weight off the shoulders of the company to be like, okay, it works here. And now I can guarantee it's going to work as I expand. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. All right. Last question. Is there anything I didn't ask that you wish I had asked? Mm -hmm. And the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. Well, you asked some really good questions. I feel like we covered a lot. Um, I guess I would say... I feel like a bit the elephant in the room with all these automation conversations is, isn't this taking human jobs? And doesn't this negate um, the person actually on the floor? And, you know, I won't make a blanket statement because there's a lot of automation out there, but I would just once again emphasize the person and people are actually central to automation. And 
I view the role of warehouse automation and especially SVT's part is not to replace a person, but just to enhance their work experience. Um, as I said, working in a warehouse is a hard job. It's long hours. It's a lot of physical labor. When you see a piece of automation um, replace the need to, let's say, push a heavy cart for, I mean, up to a mile. I mean, you're doing so much walking in a warehouse to an intelligent bot that can just move on its own and walk alongside walk alongside the person. Um, that's what I'm focused on. And that's where I think we should focus our automation efforts. It's, it's not about replacing the person. It's just about making their job easier. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think you paint a nice picture. It's like, um, it's incredibly, yeah, to your point, like people are standing up, they're walking around and then, then add like massive weight to that. Right. <laughs> People's, <laughs> their backs, their knees, oh, their feet, right. um, for hours and hours and days on end. Um, and especially during peak season, I'm sure it just exacerbates, um, those, those situations. So that's such a good point. And I think a good reminder of, um, you know, there's, I think there's so much opportunity to automate. A lot of facilities aren't automated, probably more than we realize, right? Like not everyone is Amazon. Um, and then there's, I think like, you know, I think you maybe said earlier, like there's these other, I think we can jump to like a bunch of, yeah, like humanoid like robots, like running around, totally replacing people. And I think there's just so many steps to your point in between that that ultimately can in improve the quality of life of the people that are working in those spaces and make their their businesses more competitive, especially in this space where there's the Amazons, right? Where um, the speed is so great and the expect expectations around delivery is, is just really high. Yes, that is definitely true. And to your point, Amazon, they're such a giant it almost feels like they're going to crush every other company out there. Um, and I also see that part of SVT's mission that there's all these third-party logistic companies that want to compete with Amazon. And I hope that our product will actually make that achievable. Amazing. All right. Well, thank you so much, Amanda. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Chloe. All right. Cheers.